Good afternoon and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be a facilitator for today's session. We have Dr. Tam Cummings with us today, one of our regular presenters, and we're always so glad that she is with us today. Our session today is sponsored by Vitas Healthcare and they do end of life care. Um, let me look at my sheet here and tell you a little bit about them. They're in 13 states in the United States. Uh, Texas, California, Florida, we have a lot of people that call in from those areas, so I wanted to let you know that they are in those areas, and they do provide hospice service and end-of-life care to families and individuals being cared for. So if you want to get in touch with VITAS and ask them about what they do, you can call 24-7, and their toll-free number is 800-723-3214. And you can reach them on the web at vitas.com. And I'll put this information in the chat box so that you'll have it available for you. So once again, welcome Dr. Tam. And let me tell everybody just a little bit about you in case they haven't seen you before, which I can't imagine, but it's possible. Uh, Dr. Tam Cummings founded her company in 2009 with the mission to inspire, educate and empower dementia caregivers. Now her professional gerontological practice in the Texas Hill Country is recognized as one of the leading educators of dementia caregivers and program design for dementia care nationally. Pam, we're glad you're here. Welcome to the session today. Thank you, Glenda, and thank you, Vitas Hospice. And, um, you know, again, we say this every time, but hospice really is something you want in place the final year of life, not the final few days. It's it's nothing to be afraid of. It's an extra layer of professional care. You get people trained in end of life care. They're interested in your loved one's comfort and that they're pain free, which is actually Glenda, the, the biggest people's biggest fear about death is not dying. It's being in pain and dying. And then I thought I'd share with you a technique I learned this week. And I always think when I learn something new like this, there's a reason for it. But this is a technique that comes from grief yoga. And I, I don't know that I can quite do it here because it involves putting your hands up in the air. But if you're sitting where you can sit and bend forward, uh, and this technique helps with grief, Glenda, because as I do the technique and bend forward, that bending causes my abdomen to roll my vagus nerve, which helps my brain to deal with uh, the hormones that are produced when you and I grieve. Okay. So huh. this is the, what is called um, a breathing yoga grief technique. So I'm going to turn to the side. So I would be sitting in a chair. Take a deep breath in, and as I breathe in, I raise my hands all the way to the, as high as I can, and what I'm trying to do, Glenda, is take in as much of a breath as I can, especially in the lower lobes, because as you and I get older, we don't breathe into our lower lobes as well as we could, as we should be, so this is a good opportunity to do that, so I breathe in all the way up, and then I exhale, and as I exhale, Glenda, I lean as far forward as I can, all the way down to my fingers touching the ground if I can, to where my torso is as flat as it can be on my legs. And then I start again with another deep breath. And as I take the next deep breath, I come all the way up again, and do this. And this is something that you do at a slope pace, Glenda, because you're moving your, your brain from one level down to another level and you don't want to do it fast. It could make you dizzy, but it causes some neurological things to happen that you may not feel at first, but it does have an effect on you. And it does help your brain clear cortisol, which is one of the main stress hormones produced when you and I grieve. And it helps with deep breathing. So um, as we age, Glenda, a couple of things we always want to watch for is that we're doing balance exercises because we begin to lose balance uh, beginning around the age of 35. And balance is incredibly important that we continue to do strength and mobility training. And 
Glenda, you know, I was raised on a ranch, you oh, know, yes. that they make me call hay, they made me work right next to grown men, I was just free labor, I'm fully aware of that. But I went to lift just the weight bar that that my my son is using right now. And I thought, wow, this is really heavy. How heavy is this? And, and they said 45 pounds. And I said, okay, well, that's kind of like a sack of feed. So I lifted the bar sack of feed weight over my head. And when I got to six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, my right wasn't lifting real well. Uh -huh. And yet I can use my body to lose, move large amounts of weight. So it really drove home for me that I may think I'm in great shape, but I need to continue to do yoga. I continue to do stretches and, and all of us need to do a little bit of weight training. And it doesn't mean we're doing Arnold Schwarzenegger bells. Go to Walmart and get those little one pound bell sets. That's all you need. And as you're watching TV, do arm curls, do up here, do all of those things. And Glenda, it's like everything else. Within two weeks, your brain begins to respond to it and your body begins to respond to it. I was ashamed to admit that my spouse sat down with that same weight bar and did 30 reps during oh, a break oh, at oh. work and never even broke a, a sweat or stopped breathing. So that hurt my feelings. And I decided I need to quit being the person who lifts the heavy feet at my house. Okay, so we're here and we uh, Glenda's going to read us a, a letter and she's right. It is a, it is a lengthy letter and um, she's edited it. And I trust Glenda's editing techniques, yeah. but this is another, I think, um, very valid description of the stress that a family caregiver goes through. Yes. And, and I think it's important to hear another person's story because you can relate in some way, I'm sure, um, to what this gentleman is going through with his spouse, with his wife. And I did edit it, but it was hard to edit a whole lot. So I'm sorry, it is still lengthy, um, but I'm hoping that you will get something from it just, you know, like Tam is. So this is from Gordon. Kathy and I met as sophomores in high school, and now these almost 54 years later, We've been married 48 years and are now parents of three beautiful children who in turn have beautiful families, but things weren't always roses. When Kathy was in her mid thirties, she began to develop benign tumors on her nerves throughout her body, except her brain. Pain, pain medications and neurosurgeries would be her constant companions for the remainder of her life. This was caused by a rare genetic disorder, which affects no more than one in 50,000 people. A few medical professionals ever encounter it, yet it is known to affect morbidity or mental capacity. However, something else sinister began to affect the love of my life. At about age 50, Kathy's world began to inexplicably shrink. At first, she had trouble with what is called executive function, and Tam's talked about that before. She had difficulty doing complex tasks or planning or carrying out everyday activities. I began to take over all the banking, driving, cooking, housekeeping, laundry, shopping. Meanwhile, Kathy began to withdraw from her friends and she began to close the curtains on the world outside. And quite literally, she began to shut the curtains and doors. We always did things as a team but it came more and more difficult to plan or carry out activities with her, to talk over things with her, or even to have a ple pleasant conversation. In recent years, she also began to have a very uncharacteristic temper, lashing out at me over the smallest things, at least daily. I urged the doctors to have Kathy put through a neuropsychological exam. They knew, and I knew, something that Kathy Something was seriously wrong. The neuropsychologist concluded that Kathy exhibits a severe major neurocognitive disorder characterized predominantly by memory, executive, and processing speed deficits. He said that these findings are consistent with a dementia diagnosis, although he did not conduct testing sufficient to determine her exact disorder. And later he comes back to that. 
Almost three years later, Kathy has slowly continued to worsen with almost daily bouts of incontinence, confusion as to place and time, suspicions, occasional hallucinations, impaired mobility, falls, and anger at me, her caregiver and friend. She cannot follow two-step two step directions. Her previously impeccable handwriting has become a crude scrawl, disorganized and jumbled. I continue to work full-time, but I am Kathy's sole caregiver. She has no idea that there is anything wrong with her mental capacities. When I try to arrange in-home care for her, especially when I need to travel for business, she is kind when people come to interview, but when they leave, she is adamant that she does not need anyone to come watch her or care for her. All of our family are too far away to help at all, and as a caregiver, I feel very isolated and alone. Continuing to work is therapy for me. I also exercise regularly. Recently, I found a dementia caregiver support group who meet once a month, meeting and getting to know others, mostly spouses who care for their loved ones, has been an encouragement and a source of information. The dedicated facilitators well experienced in elder and dementia care also share insights and resources. But despite all of these things to help me cope personally, at the end of the day, so they say, it is just Kathy and me. What is this disease process that has taken toll on my precious, brilliant Kathy's brain? Where is she going and what course will she take? How long will her pain and suffering last? And is it Alzheimer's, frontal temporal lobe dementia, one of the many dementias, more questions than answers. She seems to have a mix of key symptoms. She ranges from lucid days to periods of confusion. Her short-term memory sometimes appears somewhat intact. Then she fluctuates, not able to grasp recent events or conversations. She loses all sense of time and space, incessantly picks and cuts at our carpet, and randomly rearranges and packs her things into Ziploc bags and backpacks as though about to leave, sometimes her real bedroom or sometimes our real home. In the process, she frequently misplaces things and blames me. She often does not recognize our home of over 20 years. I can seldom get her to shower. We have all of our necessary legal documents in place, but I seek her involvement and consent on family discussions where possible, which often leads to frustration and inaction. I must often deceive her or take unilateral actions or else little would be accomplished. Our marital intimacy, both physical and spiritual, have been practically gone for many years. I long to touch and be touched. I long to pray and study God's word with her. I am sometimes suddenly seized by grief as I see Kathy as she is and remember the vibrant and engaging woman and dear friend and lover she once was. And as I consider the loss of fun, family, and ministry we had hoped for later life as empty nesters. After much research, I have come to realize that advanced neuropsychological diagnostics are, are out of reach for the vast majority of dementia patients and their caregivers. We live in a large community that has not even one qualified doctor for these issues. Even the nearby very large metro area only has a small handful of neuropsychologists who specialize in dementia diagnostics. I have tried and failed to get Kathy to agree to more testing with one such team, but she believes that I'm the one that needs testing. She refuses even when I offer for us both to be assessed. So I have resigned myself to just knowing that yes, she has some form of dementia. Even knowing exactly what it is would not change today and the challenges with which we must contend and the little joys and blessings we share moment by moment, day by day, as we walk this long and uncertain road. Very touching, very touching. Oh, it makes you have to take a breath. Um, 
It was interesting, Glenda, as I listened to you read it, because it was, it, I'd already obviously read it. Um, as I listened to you read it, I, I thought he is describing the order of dementia, um, a loss of executive function. That's usually what a family member notices first, if they understand executive function. And executive function, Glenda, is our ability to think, plan, and carry out a task. And that could be a complex task, planning a daughter's wedding. That could be a task of inviting friends over for dinner. That could be a task of cleaning the house and changing the bed, doing the laundry. You heard him begin to talk about he was doing her IADLs. He was doing the finances. He was doing the shopping. He was doing the cooking. He was doing the driving. He was making all the decisions. And the IADLs, the instrumental activities of daily living, are the things you and I learn as teenagers and in our early 20s. That's our step into adulthood education. And her dementia has caused her to lose that ability early. And that is an indicator to the neurologist of where damage in her brain is occurring. The other clue was that she began to demonstrate these symptoms in her 50s, which indicates sort of by our math, he's been a caregiver for 20 years on top of the time before that where he was a caregiver because of the tumors. He then talked about, <coughs> excuse me, how he was actually doing ADL care with her, which is now the personal care you and I begin to learn as infants to about the age of nine or 10, when we could safely and correctly shower and bathe. And you heard him say like every caregiver we've ever spoken to says, I can't get them to shower. They don't know how to shower anymore. And so that's another indicator. There's quite extensive brain damage because it indicates this person's brain is operating at the ability of someone who's too young to correctly be able to understand the need to bathe. He talked about how she had naturally, she had made a smaller space at home. You know, a lot of time, Glenda's when families do have to move their loved one into a memory care building or into a, a skilled facility, they're a little bit shocked at the size of the room. But the size of the room is small on purpose, because if you could watch this person at home, they have naturally made their space smaller because they seem to be able to navigate that area better. And we know part of that has to do with their vision is impaired. He talked about how he can't have conversations with her. And when he does, she gets very, very agitated with him. And uh, this is something I think probably all family caregivers have seen. And, and Glenda, you and I know that the majority of it happens because you keep pointing out what they're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And since the human brain doesn't recognize it has damage, all you're doing is pissing them off and, and you're in the room with them. So they're going to come right back at you. He then said that the doctors had diagnosed her with major severe with a severe major neurocognitive disorder, and it's actually um, that is the new terminology to say the word dementia, hmm. um, because it was determined that people didn't really understand what the word dementia meant in the meeting of the APA where they redo the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Illnesses, uh, which is the book that all doctors use uh, to determine how to classify an illness. Um, in this book, they changed in the last edition, which was edition five, they changed dementia to fall under major neurocognitive disorder or disease. And so which one of those sounds scary, dementia or major neurocognitive disease? Hmm. Yeah. So it was people would have a better understanding of it, but you see that even then he had a doctor who understood the new classification, but that doctor didn't explain to him what that actually meant. He um, said that she demonstrates suspicious behaviors, that she is suspicious of him, that she thinks he's doing stuff. And every family caregiver I know has been accused of stealing, accused of lying, accused of theft. You took my car, you took my checkbook, you took my wallet, you took my purse, you've uh, taken my clothes, my shoes, uh, my bank account, my house. 
And all of that has to do with brain damage and increase in anger, which um, some of the dementias have a, an angrier component to them. But Glenda, you and I both know 50% of all behaviors in dementia are untreated chronic pain. 20% of behaviors are caused by you and me aggravating this person without realizing we're aggravating. We're trying to teach them. We're trying to show them. We're trying to tell them they just did it wrong. We're trying to argue with them and make them understand reality. And these folks have brain damage. So uh, that isn't going to work. Then he talked about something that you and I are very big on, which is you got to be in a support group. And he talked about how the support group helped. It wasn't perfect, but it helped. And it gave him an ability to talk to others who were going through the same thing he was. And that he made very clear was, was very important to him, although it still hurt. He said some things that were interesting, Glenda, and you run into this and um, you find out it actually happens frequently in dementia, uh, but family members don't know this. So they see it and think, oh, they're doing something really, really weird. He talked about her picking at the carpet. Yeah. So if everybody looks around at a carpet right now that's near them somewhere, you will notice a refraction on it, a spot of light on it, a piece of it that just sort of shines or glistens. Your brain looks at it and goes, lint moves on by and doesn't, doesn't think about it again, but they seem to be able to, because of impaired vision, somehow that bright spot catches their attention. And the same way a child would get down and try to see what that is. If you watched an infant, mm -hmm. the person with dementia will frequently get down on the floor and pick a carpet. And to somebody who doesn't understand dementia, this looks like, okay, now they're just crazy. And they're actually just picking at light things that they're seeing. Um, he talked about how she would pack her stuff up. And that is, again, a normal behavior. My brain has so much damage, Glenda, that I think I'm eight years old. And if I'm eight years old, my mom and dad are looking for me. So I better get home. And that's what she's trying to do. She's not trying to make him uh, a bad guy. She's got so much brain damage. She doesn't realize this is not home. This is, as far as he can tell, this is their home. They've lived here 20 years. This is their home. But when she looks around with her damaged brain, this is not home. And she's that little kid who wants to go home. It doesn't mean a physical, tangible building. It's right. an emotion it's textures, it's the bed, the bedroom, those sorts of things. She blames her husband. Well, Glenda, if you're the one there and I can't find my purse, it must be you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, part of dementia is the brain is still trying to be logical and analytical in, in a way. And if I can't find something, but Glenda's here, my brain logically deduces that it had to be Glenda. Yeah. And Glenda's the one has, who has taken it. And so he gets blamed for things. He has done enough research that he has narrowed down the dementias that his wife is, is dealing with. And I think there's a, a more than one dementia that's happening there. And I'm sure it's not helped at all by the pain that he already knew she felt from the benign tumors that attack her nerve endings. So she would need a pain specialist. She would need a dementia specialist. And I think there's no doubt if he looked at the FTD website, which is T-H-E-A-F-T-D.org, if he looked at that website <clears throat> and clicked on the menu bar of what is FTD, I think that he would be able to read the clinical features and realize that his wife has exhibited symptoms of this because he's certainly describing uh, one of the frontal temporal dementias. And then he almost begins to describe another one. And then given the length of time his wife has been sick, you would assume Alzheimer's has now joined it just because we know that is a progression that, that will happen with that dementia. And so as I read his letter, I was horrified because on top of all of this, and this is part of what Glenda edited out, this woman was incredibly intelligent, like scary intelligent, like the kind of IQ I can't even imagine intelligent. And 
anytime you have somebody with that level of intelligence or, or just a higher IQ, you're always dealing with cognitive reserve. And cognitive reserve is the testing materials are made for the average IQ of 100. But what if this woman's IQ was 170, Glenda? She has to have massive brain damage before the test that we have for dementia would even show her on the test. So he's got that challenge. And then he said something that I think is very telling. He said he tries to include her in family discussions. And then he tries to deal with the aftermath when she's highly agitated. Mm -hmm. And he's so exhausted, he's not putting together that three people we can't argue with and win, teenagers, none of us have ever won an argument with a teenager. Glenda, you have a child, I know you've had this, <laughs> uh, drunk people, you can't win an argument with drunk people, and you can't win an argument or be logical with somebody with dementia. And in all three cases, it has to do with brain function. And teenagers, their brain's only halfway developed. The brain doesn't finish developing until the early 30s. In drunk people, their brain function is impaired by alcohol. And in dementia, you have people with brain damage. So they don't get to be part of the discussions about treatment or decisions about medical care or medical placement. Because no more than we go to a five-year-old and ask them, do you want us to get you up every day early for the next 18 years and you can go to school and then you can go to, on to college and then, you know, go on for the rest of your life and get up early? Or would you like to keep sleeping late every day and just playing and watching cartoons? I mean, five-year-olds would say, yeah, I'll stay right here. I don't want to do that. But we're the adults, so five-year-olds have to go to school. Does that make sense, Glenda? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I thought his letter, oh, and then he talked about his grief. Yeah. And he Loss. recognized where he has overwhelming moments of grief. And anybody on this call, how could you not be grieving? The person you love is slowly dying in front of you. This isn't like a car accident or a sudden heart attack or they were suddenly taken from you. This is so dangerous to family caregivers because of the amount of time it takes for the disease to progress the person to the end of life. Yeah. Does that make sense, Linda? Sadly so, yes. We always have so, a bit of sadness in these calls. And then, you know, he even noticed that her short-term memory fluctuates, which points again to FTD because in the different dementias, you know, not everybody has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So other dementias, the hippocampus doesn't die right away um, to where the person looks like what we think of as somebody with dementia looks. And so his wife's age, her presentation, her trouble with these benign tumors, all of those things would have added to uh, just making her journey worse. Mm. The, you know, I, I'm so happy that he's going to that support group, but it seems like uh, I wish he would tune in <laughs> is what I guess I'm getting to and get some support and information in other ways and um, hearing from other caregivers and professionals. So, well, you know, he made a statement in his in his um, letter, Glenda, about. Did it really matter? No. Which to me yes, she has. Yes, and, yes. and to me, yes, it does. Because knowing the dementia allows you to let so much anger go because you're able to actually say they did that because their frontal lobe is damaged. And if you can, can't make any other adjustment in your thinking, change it to cancer. She has cancer in her frontal lobe. That's why she's behaving that way. Nothing your loved one is doing is on purpose. Yeah. Everything this lady is doing is his beloved, beloved wife, uh, somebody that he has shared everything with, and, and now he's just lost her. Everything that he's writing is what every family goes through. And, you mm -hmm. know, now if he hated her guts, Glenda, that'd have been a totally different letter, you know, but when you love someone, it, it is excruciating. Well, you know, the other part of that that touched me, um, because we've talked about it so often, 
he pointed out that, you know, there isn't someone that he can go to who can give a correct diagnosis because it's not available in his area mm-hmm. or there's limited resources in that area. And you and I know that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think we need some advancement, you know, in the numbers of people that help people with dementia as far as neuropsychology and all of that. So that was my point on that. <laughs> Went off on a tangent. Well, are you ready to see what our our participants have to say today? Oh, sure, sure. Okay, if you have a question. I don't know, I, bet I was sort of crying while you were reading, so they, I don't know. Ah, well, I know, it was hard to get through. I had to read it over several times before I read it live so I could get through it. <laughs> Hi, Melody, good to see you today too. Uh, okay, does anybody have a question, a comment, want to talk about your particular situation? The chat box is open if you're more comfortable doing it there. Uh, or you can just unmute your microphone and I'll call on you by name. You can raise your little hand on, on Zoom if you want to do it that way. So who has something that needs to be discussed or answers to questions? Guinevere, and then I see Melody, I'll get to you next. Guinevere, go ahead. Um, listening to the letter, I'm like Dr. Cummins, it was very touching and emotional for those who are going through those things in which I have and still am. But the best thing I can see in the whole situation is as you said, find a support group and stay in it. Yeah. That's what has helped me with you, Linda and Dr. Uh, Cummins. And um, I've learned to know that with the short-term memory that my husband is experiencing at this point, and I mean constantly, I have to tell myself it's not purposely Mm. because you can't take on an anger, an angerness about it because it's all driven to you or in your direction. And you gotta know what that is all about so you can handle it or try to handle it. I give the world to you and Dr. Cummins. That's why I'm still here. (laughs) And we're so glad about that too, Guinevere. We're glad you're with us. You you share so much with us and it helps so much. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Melody, you had something to add? I do. Thank you so much. Um, I have two questions. I don't want to monopolize though. My first is, is there, Dr. Cummings, an average general length of time as to the efficacy of Alzheimer's medicines, because that's what we're taking in our home. And then my second question is a pickup of uh, Guinevere's about an anger that can you can take on. I'm so royally tired of people saying, I know exactly what you're going through. Yeah. Yeah. When turns out they're carrying, in most instances, for a grandfather who's in another state who doesn't wow. live with him or her. And I'm getting to the point now where I don't let that roll off me. And it's, it's not ugly, but it's not real nice either. And the other piece that I'm finding, and I, I have a counselor, I do get away, I I'm grateful for these groups. But the other piece is keep me posted, which people say to me. And that's like you just gave me a task to do. Mm, mm. And I don't want a task, any more task. So mm. I just wonder about this <laughs> being out in the public response, what might be appropriate there. Well, I think um, I think you bring up some wonderful wonderful points. Um, And you say some things that are concerning. I think that keep me posted is, I think that's driven by the Facebook world. Um, I think I, and I don't Facebook, I have a marketer who apparently Facebooks for me. Apparently I'm very nice, but um, I, I think everybody assumes that at some point in the day, you stop and tell everybody in known creation what you had for lunch that day. I mean, I think they just think that they're 
the the life you're living right now is something that you know a couple of times a day you just uh, break off a 20 minute break here and you go uh, piddle away on your computer for a while and Facebook with everybody and they don't realize that the job you're doing doesn't give you time for that and if you have 20 minutes it's certainly not to read what everybody's eating for lunch that day does does that make sense another thing is um you're doing all the things that that we've asked you to do you really are you're you're seeing someone your doctor knows you're paying attention to your health you're doing all this other stuff but yet your stress levels are so high that people who think they're being nice to you are now starting to make you really angry, which mm -hmm. tells us that you've got, in spite of everything, a whole lot of anger built up inside. And Glenda and I have discussed this a thousand times, how angry you can be as a caregiver and how angry you can be at the disease and how angry you can be at doctors who don't know, who don't care, ageism, family members. I'm taking care of grandpa, but he lives five states away. And really, I don't do anything at all to take care of him. And that's completely different than I'm having to change my husband's diaper. So I think when I, when I listen to you, and, and probably I think all of us have been there, but I use the glass analogy to move you into this next technique. So you know how you can have a glass of water, Glenda? And it's so full of water, it actually bows up. And you put a little more water in it and the water doesn't run out. It just bows up a little bit more to where water's actually over the level of, the, of your glass. And you add a few more drops, Melanie, and the glass doesn't empty, just a couple of drops run over. Oh. Mm. And what we want everybody to be able to do is to get some of that water which is the anger out of that glass and one of the ways you do that is by using the screen technique mm -hmm. and to stay focused on anger for as long as you screen so uh if i were going to do the screen technique right now i would let all the dogs go outside because i don't want to scare the dogs and i don't want to do it outside because i might actually scare wild animals or neighbors on ranches down the road but I take the dogs outside. I turn on the TV actually so I don't scare myself, Glenda, because of the amount of emotion that you're carrying, Melanie, Guinevere, all of you. That I mean, think about this is not what retirement was supposed to be like. This isn't who you married. The, the jokes aren't funny anymore. All you want to do is sleep, but when you sleep, look what's waiting for you when you wake up. So do you ever really, really sleep? Yeah, we know you need to sleep. We know you have depression, but we can't get you to go to the doctor for depression. If you go to for depression, do they actually listen to you? So it just piles up on you. And then those of you who are step parents, I, Glenda, last week I met a woman. She's been a stepmother for 40 years. The daughter still won't accept her. Oh, and God. they're making these final moments horrible. So you've got all of these things to be angry about. Lots. To get the glass to empty. The only thing that we really know how to do it quickly and effectively, turn on the TV, put the dogs outside. You may even need to turn the shower on. I recommend you do it late at night because it's frequently physically exhausting. But you take the tea towel, the cup towel the dish towel whatever towel it is twist it bite it and then staying focused on anger and this is the hard part of the technique glinda is to not let the emotion of crying and being overwhelmed take over first but to tell your brain i'm mad i'm mad about this disease i'm mad what this is doing this is all of that stuff and scream it as loud as you can Get a cup of hot tea ready. Get some honey for your hot tea. It, frequently, the throat hurts when this is done. And then for a lot of people, you want to scream your anger for as long as you can. Then you may begin to feel overwhelmed with grief and go ahead and cry. Those are grief tears. But try to get the anger out first. 
if you can do that, it brings that filled up glass, it empties it down to something that you can carry around. Mm. Okay. And then the, the other part is people are idiots. Bottom line. <laughs> people are, I mean, people are idiots and, and COVID has not helped. I mean, the, the people say stuff now they would never say before. And social media platforms, text messages, it's all of us know it's allowed people to say things to you they would never say to your face. And people you thought were real cool people, you may have found out aren't because of social media. So take breaks where you can, stay away from the news. You know, I guarantee you the same horrible stuff that happened today happened last week and it'll happen again next week and reading about it every day. Your brain can't handle the emotion of it and it does overwhelm you. If you, and this has been something I've really had to work on, Glenda. If I get into a place in the grocery store and I get in there and I suddenly can feel that this is just too much for me, you know, it's okay. I can, I can walk out and I can go home and I can grocery shop another time. I, if I begin to feel myself getting too overwhelmed, I can't be a good caregiver. So I've got to be able to pull something back for myself and say, you know what, Melanie, right now I don't have to go do this. So it's okay if it doesn't get done. Is the house as clean as I want it to be? No. But is it okay right now if I sit down and put my feet up? Yes. Yes, it is. Everybody is safe. And remember, the only thing we can do is right now in this moment. And as dementia caregivers, it is so easy to start moving into what if, what if, what if. And what if creates our anxiety, coulda, woulda, shoulda, is depression. And to remember, depression shows about 10 years before the onset of Alzheimer's. And if you're in treatment for other stuff, and this isn't Melanie, this is anybody, if you're already in treatment and you still feel all of this emotion, they need to make adjustments. Something needs to be tweaked just a little bit. Okay. But try the screen technique and Melanie, you know how to contact me. Let me know if it, if it helps. I will. I will. Thank you very much. And the medicines, is there a general oh, the timeline about the Alzheimer's on efficacy? Or dementia? Oh, yeah. uh, most, the medicines make me a little unhappy. Um, they were intended to be started when people were in stage two or stage three of the disease, but most people in our country are not diagnosed until stage five. Then the medications are started and now the effects of those medications are the disease literally gets drug out for two to three more years. As a general rule of thumb, Aricept, Razadine and Exelon are discontinued in stage six of the disease, but Namenda is continued until the end of life because Namenda stops glutamate from building up in the brain and too much glutamate causes death. So normally they're withdrawn. They have about a 30 day half-life, which means uh, based on how chemicals are broken down in the body, it takes about 30 days before these drugs are completely out of your loved one's system. So in between four and six weeks, you will then see a significant decline as your loved one will move down to the stage where they actually are. And at that point, they cannot go back on the medicine because it won't do anything for them. Okay. Very What's helpful. Actually Thank you. To me is, is no one ever explains to you, this is what the medicine was for. It was intended to be started very, very early. So the person would continue to age, but not develop late dementia stages. And instead it's not started until it's already too late. And so what would your loved one say? Keep me alive, bankrupt mm -hmm. yourself. Uh, I don't have much brain left, but keep me going anyway. Or would your loved one say, keep me comfortable, feed me chocolate and let me go. And, and nobody ever gave you the chance to, to ask those questions. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Thank you so much, Melody. Um, all right, let's get over to our chat because we've got a lot of stuff going on there. I just really love what Myra had to say. She said, finding a support group is like dating sometimes. It's so great. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you attend one and then you had go to a few sessions. You find it's not right. So you go to another one. So I love that, Myra. And it is so true. 
And she also said that she agreed and she felt like that Melanie also feels. And let's get down here, Blake. She says, I have a question about knowing when it is the best time to seriously consider independent living slash assisted living and what to do to help convince them that living there would be the best thing for them. Now, that's a toughie. We've discussed that before. And so you well. can't argue with teenagers, drug people, mm -hmm. or people with dementia. And if you're already thinking AL, they should really be in memory care. The building is going to push you for AL. But what families don't realize is if your person is not stage three or stage four, they're actually stage five, they get picked on in AL when no one's watching. And it is, it's, it's cruel. So use your staging tool and you can find staging tools on, on the website um, or Minerva will, send, Minerva will send them out to you. But uh, if your loved one is in stage five, they should not be in assisted living. Uh, any, you have to understand this is business. This is big billion trillion dollar business. And it is money for them to put your loved one into assisted living when they're not appropriate for assisted living. And the only way you know is to, to stage your loved one, to know what stage they're in, because that tells you how much brain damage they have. And even though everybody behaves while you're standing there next to your mama, when you leave, those other people in AL are not nice to your loved one if your loved one is more declined than they are. Mm. I had never thought about that. Good. Point. Oh, it's like the, we call it the mean girls of junior high. Did you oh. ever wear where they live? They all grow up, they've got dementia, and but they don't have dementia as advanced as your loved one. So people in earlier stages of dementia are quite nasty to people who are more advanced. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I don't think we've ever touched on that in all these years. Ugh, scary stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you have any other questions, um, you can put them in the chat box. You can unmute your mic um, or at the end, we'll tell you how to reach Dr. Tam. She loves to hear from everybody. Let's see. Barbara says, I'm so frustrated by the eating obsession of FTD at my, of my loved one in the home. Any suggestions other than locking the fridge and cabinets? Our conversations always center on food and I'm exhausted. Okay, so that is the classic feature of behavioral variant FTD. They basically have cancer in the area of the brain that drives the pituitary gland. And usually they will focus on one food. I've known somebody that would eat 20 Big Macs a day, somebody eating 200 bananas a day, somebody eating, I think, between 15 and 20 pounds of sugar a day. And that was all they ate. Uh, one guy was eating five gallons of Rocky Road ice cream, which Glenda, I can actually make an argument for the ice cream. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. So I realize it is horribly, horribly frustrating, but it is normal because of where their brain is damaged that somebody with behavioral variant FTD gains 40 to 60 pounds in two to three months because of a sudden damage in the brain that forces them to continue to eat. Now, when they go into care, we use that special food as a way to get them to do their ADLs, to get them to do the things that we need them to do. And remember, this is not Alzheimer's. This is much, much different. So you need to go to the FTD website because the more information you have on behavioral variant FTD, the better prepared you are. As frustrating as it is, as exhausting as it is, Everything is about food because that's what their brain is telling them the, the focus is. So if they were in a community, we would have all kinds of little snack foods to give them. Little goldfish, little Ritz crackers. Uh, we do lots of crackers and cheese, lots of uh, not peanut butter. Peanut butter is too much of a choke wrist, especially for FTD people. Um, on the website, you can get the FTD staging tool. And as you go down behavioral variant, if there's an X in the box, the behavior on the left-hand side is associated with that form of FTD, and it'll let you see how advanced your loved one's dementia is. But Barbara, as hard as it is, it's, it is the classic feature of the disease. If you walked in and gave me no other information but that, I would know immediately which dementia you're talking about because it's so unique. In stage six, 
no matter how much weight he's gained, it's all going to go away. It's all going to go away. And then you'll be angry at yourself and you'll be mad that you didn't just let him eat. So right now, just let him eat. Just try to get low cal things, non choky things. So no peanut butters, no caramels, no things like that, but crackers, uh, bits of apple, fruits, things like that, just in little bunches. He's not doing it on purpose. It's like being mad at the COPD person because they can't breathe. They, they can't help what their lung is doing. He can't help what's happening in his brain. This is not hereditary. This is not something he did that caused this to happen. This is a shot in the dark and it is a horrible dementia. And I'm, I'm so sorry. And go scream. And go scream, but yeah. not where anyone can hear you. The children will call the police. The neighbors will call the police. Turn the TV on loud. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Natalie, if you want to unmute your mic right now, you can go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, so my father is in between um, stage six, stage seven. Uh, we started him in assisted living, um, which goes back to the question someone else asked it in it. They put him right in assisted living and he kind of needed to be in memory care. So you were, you were right on the nose with that. Um, we ended up moving him to memory care. Um, my biggest question is being stage six or seven, he's pretty dependent on the nurses and everyone to, you know, help him go to the bathroom, help shower. He can still talk. He can still do little things, but does, are they aware what their life is at this point? Are they depressed or are they just blissfully ignorant at this point? Um, they do have depression. The depression is an atypical form and they're angry, annoyed, agitated, and aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's how the depression manifests itself. But for the most part, based on the amount of brain damage at this point, you're mm -hmm. talking about your grandfather's now lost at least a pound of brain tissue and has the equivalency of between a four-year-old and an infant. Wow. And so they're not really aware of, of what's going on around them. They, he wouldn't really be recognizing y'all as who you were. Um, his language skills would be greatly diminished. He would look sick. A stranger looking at him would say this person is sick with dementia. Mm -hmm. His face wouldn't have much emotion on it. And if he's six going into stage seven, it would be time to be talking about hospice care. Yeah, the, uh, we want that in place for a long time. We pay our tax dollars for it. We want to use right, it. right. Yeah, they've they briefly mentioned that we're approaching um, the time for hospice to come in. Um, now tell them to go ahead, go ahead and bring it in. Go ahead and bring it in. It's an extra layer of care for your for your grandpa. Now, does that expire? Because I or nope. Okay, so even if he just teeters on level six, seven for six months, they'll hospice will still stay there with him. We, we hope he's there for the final year. That's amazing. I didn't know hospice was an option until it was like stage seven and on. No, no, no. Um, it is, it, it changes from state to state, but basic uh, things are your loved one's lost weight three months in a row. Uh, your okay. loved one can't follow a complete sentence, can't do uh, a command. Okay. Uh, so it, it is advanced stage dementia. We used to see, oh, what, probably 15 years ago, Glenda, we would see stage five people on dementia wow. uh, with dementia on hospice for five years. Well, obviously they, they yeah. weren't going anywhere. Uh, we loved it because it gave them, you know, it was an extra layer of professional care, but uh, Congress really put the kibosh on that. So uh, it's more difficult to get hospice now, but you're okay. looking for the diagnosis is called adult failure to thrive. Okay. And there'll usually be a significant change in status in your loved one. And um, it's either a significant change in status or just that slow precipitous decline. And now they're to the point where they require care and language is mostly gone. And then you, you just ask the doc doctor for the hospice order. The doctor writes an order. You can interview as many hospice companies as you want to, and you want the group close to you, the group you feel good about. And okay. they go into all the communities as well. There are even some communities that have their own hospice companies within the community. 
Oh, wow. That's really helpful. And the, the memory care rooms, when you guys were talking about it to the previous question before, uh, moving from assisted living to memory care, the room was like half the size and I never knew why, but it makes sense how you, how you guys explained it. It, it he's well, almost happier in the smaller room. Oh yeah. If you realize that they can't see out of their left eye, yes, they can only see a tunnel here mm -hmm. around and you realize the world looks much, much different. And that big wide open space you and I want yes. is a big, scary, empty Yes, I was nervous about that, but the smaller room actually was able to settle him more on a day to day basis, especially during the sundowning and all that. I mean, it was amazing. Well, the, the other thing is over in AL, you don't have staff who understand, stop Correct. asking you questions, Correct. and <laughs> people are asking you questions, and right. who are you, and who am I, and do you know where you are? And, and it's actually for people with more advanced dementia, AL is not fun. It yes. is not fun. The people yes. don't understand what's wrong. And yes. so they, and as you hear from the letter Glenda read last month, the person with dementia picks up on how angry people yes. are with them. And, yes. and why would we want to do that to someone. Yes. Yes. So helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks. You're Natalie. welcome. Love the hair. Oh yeah, I do too. Um, Thank you. Barbara, I got tickled because I read Barbara's message in the chat box and she said that she's at work and she can't scream. And so I started thinking, well, could she go to the car? But then somebody yes. might call the police. And so, yeah, wait, do you, nope. wait, do you, wait go to the car, time, nope. go to the car, turn the car on, turn the radio on, turn the radio on, on really, really loud and just scream, just yeah. scream and get it out and just be prepared. Glenda, you can be really surprised at how much anger is inside that 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 needs to come out. But Barbara, you know, let us know. Let us know how it went. Let us know if you blew any windows out and if the police came. We'll vouch for you. <laughs> yeah, I was worried about the police, Barbara. So watch out for that. Uh, Blake says, thank you. No more questions. Now, this brings up an interesting point, and I know you'll pick up on it, Tam. She says it's still early stage as of last brain scan, but more noticeable than before. The uncharacteristic behavior of lashing out at me and being suspicious is happening and is difficult to deal with. So the brain scan, can you talk about the brain scan a little bit and what um, that is showing as opposed to maybe behavioral stuff? Well, the behavioral stuff says it's not early. The behavioral stuff says this is more advanced and you have to understand medical terminology doesn't mean necessarily what people might think it means. So for example, stage five is called moderately severe dementia, but it doesn't say moderately severe dementia. And at the beginning, a half a pound of brain tissue is gone, but at the end, there'll be a whole pound of brain tissue gone. And so uh, I can't tell you how many times, Glenda, people have called and said, it's not bad. It's only moderately severe. And I'm like, eek, moderately severe. That's the start of the late stages. There's significant brain damage there. So um, it, could, it could be how the MRI is written or how the summaries of the scans are written. Um, they're written in medical language. And doctors think that they're clearly giving information to families and you're also, you, you have to assume what level is this doctor? Are they board certified? Is this a doctor who specializes in dementia? Do they recognize what the brain should look like and what this indicates? Um, because it's just a little bit, it, it, it's, it's different. Um, the behaviors are stage five behaviors, but an early stage would be something that I would think of as being stage two or stage three of dementia. So what you're saying is the the behaviors that she's mentioning, the lashing out, suspicion, blah, blah, blah is a stage five behavior, not a stage two or earlier. On. Not an early behavior. That's a, a late behavior. Now, the only caveat is Lewy body dementia. And remember, this is the dementia where the person sees hallucinations and the four most common hallucinations are they see children, they see bad people coming to get them. And Glenda, that could be, uh, it could sound like they're describing an army SWAT team, police, just bad people, family members. Um, 
I've had f- people describe it to me and to me, they're clearly bad people coming to get them and they don't understand that's the hallucination. It's, it's a bad people coming to get me hallucination. Um, the th- next hallucination is bug spiders, rats, and snakes crawling on me and biting me. Uh, the fourth hallucination is the spouse or the caregiver having sex with, with people everywhere. In Lewy body dementias, that suspiciousness and lashing out behavior actually begins in stage three of the dementia. In all of the other forms of dementia, that behavior she's describing is a stage five behavior. But Lewy body should have been something that a doctor would have would have been discussing with her uh, if or him based on the age of the person and the doctor should ask, are there hallucinations? Yeah. Yeah. It's scary stuff, Blake. And we know that, um, I think looking at the staging tool on Tam's website would be of help to you. So you can kind of look at the behaviors that are described there and have a, a more of a clear, uh, view of, of, uh, what her, what her stage is. That'll help you. I think a lot. And then you do that after three months or so, right? Again, you do it again, Tam, after a certain amount mm-hmm. of time so that you can- You don't read it every day, Glenda, or you'll begin to think it's that you have it too. Um, yeah. When we were in school, remember in social work, we had to read the MMSE. They made us promise, you know, that we would understand we were reading these diseases. We don't have these diseases yet. I had a classmate come back. She was bipolar. This one was schizophrenic. This one had a personality. They they all took on behaviors of uh, the the diseases they had read out. So we were warned before we went, went off to do that. Yeah, right. But, but to see how the disease pro- progresses is what I was getting at. I didn't yes. say it clearly. Yes, you don't want to read it every day. You will begin to think you have it. So every three months, uh, which matches, should sort of line up with uh, in, in care, in professional care, you have a quarterly care plan meeting. And so that's why we think about using it quarterly. Yeah. Um, it gives you enough break between looking at the behaviors and seeing where your loved one is now. Right. Blake, okay, you can get unmute your phone if you want to go ahead and speak up. Uh, yeah, I just the same. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Blake. Okay. Um, Natalie came back and she said, she said, I've not heard this one, Natalie, so I'm glad you brought it up. Is it normal that they are dialing 911 several times a day when they find a phone? Yeah. Very normal. Um, I have a guy that I know that is actually dialing 911 because those, it turns out those are the last three digit of his wife's phone number. Oh, wow. And so here's sort of a general rule of thumb. When I was in communities and ran dementia communities, dementia, if you were in dementia locked memory care, you didn't get a phone. And this is the reason why they call 911. They call family members at three in the morning thinking that it's daytime. Uh, It's just, it's too confusing for them and it's too upsetting for them. And you begin to make the 911 people mad. In some states, they'll even send you a bill. Oh yeah. We've got uh, lots of bills already. (laughs) Yeah. So um, they they don't need access to a phone because they're not understanding the concept of of 911. One one, and it's also an indicator that this person's no longer safe at, at home alone if they're home alone. Yeah. yeah, that okay. That I'm glad to hear that's normal. Um, with that being said, in this memory care, they do allow a phone, but I agree they kind of shouldn't because he just doesn't know how to use it anymore. I live in New York, and he is in Texas, and the phone is all I have sometimes with him. How do what are my other options? Are there any other options? Uh, the normal option is that you call the staff and set up a normal time that you're going to FaceTime with him and they'll take him their iPad or phone mm-hmm. that they're whatever it is, however they do it. But that's oh. done in the U.S. You just set up a time that you're going to call and visit with him. Then they have him ready and they connect with you once, once y'all are ready to make your call. Wow. I didn't know I, I could ask that. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. That's, that's awesome. Uh, they, they make it sound like I'm, you know, kind of not putting them out, but they're, you know, busy. And I, I don't know. I, I say oh, I'd see, ra- by law, this is that man's home. And by law, 
they work for that man. Okay. And okay. By law, that man wants to talk to his granddaughter. So by law, right. they have to make that part of their daily job. Okay. Now it could be, um, I've seen communities, Glenda, where the nurse does it. I've seen communities where it's the activity director. I've seen communities where it's the marketing director. It's, it's usually going to be the activity director or your uh, grandfather's personal caregiver, whoever is his uh, most common normal caregiver. Okay. You okay. Set it up with that person and they'll make it happen. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's like Latanya said, it's residence rights. So thank you, know. you Latanya, using big words like that. Yeah. Yeah. I never I like thought it. of that. I never thought of it being that by law, that is his home. You're right. You know, you never, you, you get oh, so by, caught up in the facility. You don't think about yeah, it. That by law, before mm -hmm. you step into his room, you have oh. to knock on his door and get permission, even with dementia. You have wow. to knock on the door and let him know you're there. Wow. Oh, so Latanya. Latanya, she told on herself. Latanya, former ombudsman. You've got me laughing on that one, Latanya. Yeah, for sure. Now I know why you use that residence rights language for sure. It makes sense. It all <laughs> makes sense now, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. I was, as I read residence right, I was wondering, what does Latanya do? He's <laughs> somewhere in a nursing home in West Texas. That's what I decided. Ah, uh, yeah. Smiley face for sure. Uh, I'm putting in the chat box Tam's phone number so that you can reach her, leave her a detailed message. She's flying all over the place doing presentations, et cetera. So she may not answer your call, but leave a detailed message and she will return your call at some point. But she always gives the caveat. The caveat is what, Tam? You'll feel if better. You don't call back call. in a certain amount of time. <laughs> Oh, I thought it was, you can call me. I'm not going to answer, but you'll feel better just because you tried to call. Um, yeah. If you haven't heard back from me in a day, call me again. It just means I'm traveling or I'm busy, but I'm not stupid. I'll figure out you need to talk to me and I'll call you back. I also don't call people back after nine o'clock at night because who wants to be talking to anybody then? No one. No, no. one. So and I would advise not to text her because I do that and... Well, okay, we won't go there. <laughs> She's sticking her tongue out at me. That's pretty bad. Okay, overtime. What's your time looking like, Pam, this afternoon? Oh, whatever anybody needs. All right, well, we'll see if anybody else has a question, a comment, a concern that they would like to have addressed this afternoon before we go our merry ways. Anybody? All right. Uh, while you're thinking about that, let me just tell you a little bit what's coming up on the Caregiver Teleconnection because we have a busy month this month. I didn't count the sessions, but there has to be, you know, I don't know, 16 or something. So I'll be Linda. back. Pardon? Yes, Linda. Linda. Chat. Huh? There, there's a question in chat. Oh, oh okay. Thank you. Uh, now I was looking at other stuff. Barbara says, another question work when do you think it is a good time to tell them you are a caregiver i don't oh uh -huh, this is a, a good concern i don't want to tell them for fear of them treating me differently promotions etc raises whatever uh well barbara when we sort of looked at the behavioral variant ftd that immediately tells us this is a younger person um, most commonly, this is somebody uh, in their 50s or early 60s, and that is the time when we make our most money as Americans. So um, I think it depends on your company and what you do and how comfortable you feel with it. A lot of times by the time I meet people, um, they've used up all their sick days. They are just e exhausted. They're trying to plan out how they're going to get through these these next few years so on the one hand the form of dementia that your husband has is extremely aggressive on the other hand i i think i mean glenda i can't imagine anyone because the the dementia your husband has is one that that requires care um, there are some dementias where you could do care at home to the to the end of life, especially if you had uh, uh, some assistance or family nearby. But the type of FTD that you're talking about with him is one that does require care because it 
just, it's one of the dementias that requires antipsychotic medication. It's uh, very, very aggressive. Alzheimer's tends to join it. It can have vascular join it. It can have other forms of FTD join it as well. Um, so it's not the lengthy journey necessarily that other people are on because of how young the person is. It's just very, very aggressive. I think it's just going to depend on what your job is, how you work. I mean, Glenda, I can't imagine somebody thinking that they're, the spouse having dementia is going to stop the promotion of this person. Um, right. And, and that struck me also in the letter that I read at the beginning, because he's still working. I mean, how do you manage all that? Well, she, he talked about getting care for her at home and then she, yeah. you know, was polite to him while they were there and then immediately mad afterwards. But that's again, because you're involving too much information to the person with dementia. They don't get to make those decisions. They don't get that, that much information. It's just overwhelming for them. Instead, this nice person shows up at the house to do stuff every day. Um, so Barbara, I guess it's just going to be based on how you like your bosses, who you feel good about in the company, where you are, where you want to go, and the reality of, of what your rest of your life is going to be like and getting prepared for that, which just sounds such a horrible thing to say. And I'm so sorry. I'm so yeah. very, very sorry. Yeah. Um, Natalie, go ahead and unmute your mic. Sorry. I just, I, I got me thinking of something else. Um, so he's, he's always asking in his moments of confusion, um, what's wrong with me? Am I okay? Am I dying? And I'm always speechless and I don't know the right answer. The Do answer I... are, the answer is yes, you're okay. okay. And no, you're not dying. Okay. Okay. I Easy mean, enough. technically <laughs> I'm dying. Technically Glenda's dying. Technically, technically you're dying. we all are. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. But the, the comment back to them, um, common things that people with dementia in a community will say is, I can't eat here. I haven't paid for it. I can't spend the night here. I don't know where I'm going to stay. I don't right. have the money to pay for this. And the staff is trained to answer right back. Oh, no, this has all been paid for. Oh, no, you served the military. Oh, no, this is part of the government. This is all part of old age. Oh, it's all taken care of. Okay. It's, okay. it's the same thing with that. It's okay. just a soothing thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Barbara said it's tough every day, but thanks us for caring. And we do care. I responded. We do. Barbara, you're, you're dealing with, there are certain dementias I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, if there's a way to say that. And that's one of them. You are not dealing with a garden variety, if there even is such a thing of Alzheimer's. You're dealing with a very challenging dementia that, that strikes somebody at what many people consider to be one of the prime parts of life. And it is devastating. You have every reason to feel exactly the way you're feeling. When Glenda and I get worried is when somebody doesn't have those feelings anymore. True fact, true fact. Okay, we're at 2.15. I'll entertain one more question or comment. Um, I, I know Ms. Dr. Tam is, is, is busy too. Uh, anyone else have one last comment or question they'd like to share? And I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you're sharing. Linda. Yeah, <laughs> I know I who that is. I just, got, I just got back on. My husband realized I was on a workshop with Alzheimer's and he come up with some cockamamie story about something. So I'll get the rest of it on the recording. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Guinevere, don't worry about it. You know how to do that, which brings up if you don't know how to do that, you can always call our customer service representative and she is happy to help you work through that. Yeah, Guinevere, keep coming back. I know we just I love having you here. I love being here. But, but look what <laughs> look what Miss Dockett did. She realized he was getting agitated at something she was doing, so she stopped doing it and said, I'll come back to this later click. Smart exactly. woman, Miss Dockett. Yeah. No, you taught me well. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, she's got a lot of experience at this too. Sadly, I say that, Guinevere. Sadly, I keep telling her she needs a secret spot in the garage with a bag full of her she kisses and a rocking chair, and she'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Uh, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing, Barbara, if you go out and scream in the car, take some chocolate with you. So, you know, that's important stuff. Okay. I think we should come to a close today. We're going to do the same format again next month. And so if you, you know, write down the questions during the month that you have and come back and join us and we'll try again. And we're going to keep trying uh, to help you through this difficult journey that you're facing. It's just, um, and it's sad for us to hear what it is, but I'm so um, excited that I am with Tam and she can help, you know, she can help. So that's good. You will be receiving a follow-up uh, email if you register for the call today. We'll include some resources there. Please be sure to go to Tam's website. There's all kinds of wonderful information there. Go to the podcast. Um, if you have feedback for us when you get that email, give it to us. Uh, if there's a topic we haven't touched on, let us know about that. If you've heard a speaker somewhere that you would like us to have on the tel caregiver teleconnection so others can also share in that, please let us know about that. Um, come back. We want to see you again next month and, and try and be here for you. Hey, I'm closing words. That's it. If That's you've it. Got a chainsaw, come and see me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tam didn't share. She she survived a recent little tornado um, at her property out there, but she look, she's smiling. So hey, we can learn from that too. Hey. Thank <laughs> yeah. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And Thanks, I do Linda. sincerely Thank hope you. to see you next month. Thank you. Bye bye, Thank everybody. You Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.